Hello, everybody. I'm Rob Wallace here in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm an evolutionary epidemiologist with the People's CDC here with an update on the COVID-19 pandemic. This week, we'll cover the state of global COVID and the state of U.S. COVID. In response to the Department of Energy's report, we'll also address the various theories as to the origins of COVID-19. As that special topic will require considerable time and attention, we're going to split this episode into two parts. The first part will offer our update of the pandemic, and in the second, also posted on the People's CDC YouTube channel, we'll report on theories of COVID's origins. We begin with global COVID. In the graph in red, the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center reports us down under 1 million new confirmed COVID cases worldwide for the week ending February 26, a low in new cases we haven't seen since mid-June 2020. But this at a time when countries around the world are rolling back their surveillance programs. The number of global weekly deaths there in white is down to 6,500 confirmed deaths this past week. In green, we see global vaccinations up to 95 million for the week. The Johns Hopkins website from which we've drawn these data since the start of our program is slated to be closed down March 10th. From here on out, we'll aim to get our global data elsewhere. The New York Times map shows hotspots over the past week. Cases per 100,000 population are flat worldwide. Even the long-term entrenched outbreaks in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and New Zealand continue to downshift. On the other hand, we see increases in Chile, Costa Rica, Austria, Germany, and Russia since mid-February. Indeed, COVID-19 is, is not down and out. We can see from these percent changes in caseloads the past couple of weeks, rebounds there in warm colors, are still scattered across the globe. In the Western Hemisphere, Mexico shows a sharp increase, while Cuba, Honduras, Colombia, Suriname, Paraguay, and Chile show slighter increases. Much of Europe, especially Poland, Belgium, and Romania, are showing uh, larger increases. Across Eurasia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Iran, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Myanmar, and Cambodia are hosting increases. Australia and New Zealand show sh uh, sh short increases. In Africa, Chad, Sudan, Togo, Liberia, Senegal, Mali, and Algeria show sharp increases with lesser ones elsewhere on the continent. Now, all these data are drawn from the Johns Hopkins uh, project. This map too may be un unavailable by mid-March. Typically, we, we follow with a map of containment and health index showing where countries are in their non-pharmaceutical campaigns, such as mass mandates, testing, and con tech tracing effort. But as we reported last week, we will no longer be showing that map as the Oxford University project collecting those data ceased at the end of 2022. And this is all going on at a time when the vaccine strategy many governments say they're pursuing instead of non-pharmaceutical interventions is largely faltering. Much of the world is that best vaccinated for variants no longer circulating. We see uneven campaigns and booster vaccination across the world. On the one hand, Chile, Peru, Uruguay, Cuba, Canada, Belgium, Finland, Germany, Italy, Australia, and Japan show top tier booster campaigns with 70 or more people boosted per 100 population. In contrast, we see near nothing in Russia, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, and those even reporting in from Africa, as well as mediocre campaigns in the US, Mexico, Brazil, China, in Eastern Europe. Now, this map hasn't changed much, although it's being reported here as being updated uh, March 4th. The CDC reports the US at a little over 16% of its el eligible population five years and older with an updated booster dose. So the mediocre vaccination campaigns, hand in hand with the rollback and the non-pharmaceutical campaigns that successful vaccination depends on, have been taking place alongside the emergence of multiple Omicron subvariants, now circulating across large expanses of the world. And so we see here XBB 1.5 coming on strong in the US and the UK in teal, XBB still strong in Spain and South Africa there in purple, BQ1 strong in Canada, Germany, and the UK, and kind of weirdly BA 2.75 back in brown in many of the countries except the US, Canada, and South Africa. Now, unfortunately, our world and data has changed its formatting to include only these countries, and, and we can no longer add additional countries to those already shown here. And it would be nice to show how the variants in the global north here differ from other countries reporting and including, say, as we have done in the past, China, Chile, Peru, and uh, South Korea. Now, we may move to using the covariance.org version of these data, uh, although their figures aren't as good. Uh, but you're starting to get the picture that the 
uh, about the uh, data availability uh, and, how, and how's that, how that is going. Now, there's another twist in data. XBB's explosive diversification is leading to another change in the naming system, and including among the new XB 1.5s, uh, EL, EK, and EM. And we have here the reds and pinks uh, as markers of the prevalence of all these uh, X1, XB 1.5 sublineages. All the while, research continues to delineate, delineate the damage uh, letting such a BSL-3 level pathogen circulate and infect people just about at will at this point. Uh, census survey estimated as many as 36 million Americans have long COVID. A July 2022 CDC estimate put it at one in 13 US adults or more than 19 million. So SARS-2 on the loose, targets a variety of, of body systems for long-term damage. New work out of Western University of Ontario identified an astonishing array of biomarkers associated with long COVID. From 2,925 unique blood proteins, the team identified 119 there in the top left that differentiated long COVID outcomes from healthy controls and acute COVID infections. The team also started the long slog of work needed to figure out which sets of proteins did what by identifying two sets, nine proteins and five proteins there in the top middle and right, associated with long-term COVID symptoms across different organ systems. The specific proteins are listed there on the bottom. So for instance, CXCL5 is a small cytokine or immune cell produced upon the stimulation of cells by inflammatory cytokines interleukin-1, or tumor necrosis factor alpha. That is, we have, we have here an immune cell helping cause long COVID. The two heat maps at the bottom show the similarities in the expression levels of the sets of nine and five proteins the patients shared with each other. The proteomics in long COVID patients were vastly different from both healthy controls and acute COVID patients there in the red, but converge with other long COVID patients there in the bottom right and blue. Those proteins appear to mark a profound shift in protein expression and perhaps function once SARS-2 turns into long COVID. We previously reported here on COVID this week, SARS-2 in the brain causes targeted cell death and hypometabolism or lower glucose consumption. New work now shows COVID reduces brain oxygenation. Those study participants with symptomatic COVID showed lesser oxygen saturation within the prefrontal cortex as measured by functional near-infrared spectroscopy and reduced performance on standard cognitive assessments. The bolded lines in this, um, a model of a population survey the team also conducted, highlights those aspects of cognitive dysfunction and psych psychiatric symptom that COVID has statistically impacted across patient demographics. We see that both symptomatic and asymptomatic infections impacted cognition, including executive function, EF, and attention, the ATT there at the top. And through the cognitive dysfunction, they also impacted anxiety and depression there on the right. The unvaccinated and age class 18 to 24 years of age were associated with cognitive dysfunction, while non-white in ethnicity and across all locales tested in Canada, Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec were associated with psychiatric symptoms. Getting infected again and again doesn't help. As we uh, reported uh, here previously, reinfection is associated with increasing likelihood of long COVID across vaccine status. A new model from a team largely based at Fractal Therapeutics, but also Dartmouth, Stanford, and Boston University, suggests that so-called hybrid immunity of natural infection and vaccine combined depends in, entirely in what SARS-2 decides to do. And even with less than a million global confirmed cases this week, which is likely a gross underestimate, the virus is capable of all the kinds of recombination and other evolutionary surges that permit it to outdistance both our population immunity and limited vaccine coverage. The team projected that declines in neutralizing antibodies from the virus's antigenic shift can lead to sudden increases in transmission and apparent infection fatality rates. And it would be millions of suddenly deadly infections before we ever got a clue of such a shift. The top three figures left to right uh, show under such a sudden shift, 
that SARS-2 would have lots of space to be immune evasive, severe in its infection, and ultimately deadly, with little room for driving the virus to extinction. The bottom figure shows the, those strains that are more likely to be transmissible are also more likely to be deadly, a standard result in modeling the evolution of pathogen virulence. Turning to the US, we see from the Walgreens COVID-19 index that as of March 1st, uh, national test positivity is holding steady at a little less than a third positive for both rapid tests and PCR, even off their January peak there. The CDC reports the latest round of excess deaths above the average deaths the past six years associated with the pandemic continues. The last few weeks report a decline. Uh, that might be a measure of true decline. It may also represent data still being collected across the U.S. As we have reported here in COVID this week, the decline in diagnostic screening and the increase in at-home rapid antigen tests have led to an underestimation of COVID infection. One team at the City University of New York estimated the extent of that underreporting. In four days in July 2022, about the time Omicron variants BA4 and 5 were ascendant, the team interviewed over 3,000 Americans by phone, asking a wide cross-section of respondents about their testing regimes and COVID symptoms if they happened to be testing positive and were sick. About 17% of participants reported being infected with SARS-2 during the BA4 and 5 period. That scales to 44 million U.S. cases, which is much higher than the 1.8 million cases estimated by the CDC for that period. The demographic showed Black and Latino patients suffered more infections, as did poorer respondents. 21.5% of the respondents who were infected four weeks before the survey reported long COVID symptoms, or higher than the 18.9% estimate reported by the U.S. Household Pulse Survey. This New York Times map shows COVID cases per 100,000 population. Spatially, the national caseload continues to roll back. We see caseloads seemingly peeled back from Northwest down through California to the Four Corners. Texas is clearing up, although the Plain States in the South still host outbreaks, particularly in Kansas, the, the Dakotas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. The two regions are clearer than a couple weeks ago. Alaska remains something of a hotspot. On the other hand, other modes of tracking COVID-19 show the virus still surging here and there. We see the levels of SARS-2 virus detected in the wastewater that comes through our sewage plants, in some cases, uh, a leading indicator of the pandemic for February 14th through 28th. In the orange and reds, we see plants at 60% or more of all the samples taken nationally since this December 2021 in Washington state, in the Bay Area and SoCal, Salt Lake City, Colorado, Nebraska, and throughout the industrial Midwest, Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Ohio, as well as West Virginia. Farther north in Maine and farther south uh, to the Carolinas. However, the more uh, acute measure of changes in sewage loads over the past 15 days uh, perhaps represent a, a better marker of transient dynamics, dynamics that are happening uh, now. And we see, compared to January, some areas heating up more than others. Parts of the Northwest, Colorado, Nebraska, Missouri, and the Carolinas, but in winding isopleths through Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, West Virginia, North Carolina, the near totality of New York State, except New York City, uh, although Ohio appears to have uh, cooled off from a recent surge. Here are the fractions of hospital beds filled by COVID patients across the 4,000 plus hospitals reporting as of February 24th, mapped by Les Schaefer. We see in spite of declines in caseloads, uh, many urban hospitals are hosting larger cohorts of COVID cases there in red, 5% and more beds filled. But we see the demand bleed outward into some local metropolitan regions. For instance, we see high demand to supply in the Twin Cities here, also sharply, sharply felt out beyond their suburbs and into farm country. The demand may be a function of COVID load, bed availability, and an area's underlying susceptibility, often deeply embedded in its socioeconomic fabric. To sum up, here's the People CDC version of our present community transmission by county as of March 2nd, mapped again by our own Les Schaefer. This map shows the combo of caseloads and test positivity that the CDC plots, now reporting only once a week, but unlike the CDC, the People CDC differentiates the high level of danger counties are subjected to beyond 10% COVID positivity into high, very high and extremely high exposure. Down at the bottom, we see that the people CDC also differentiates exposure by the percent of counties 
and by the percent population. So overall, we see a continuing spatial contraction here in the US, including the West Coast, Texas, parts down South and New England. Uh, although the West uh, part of the country east of California seems to be filling in again. Alaska, the Arizona, New Mexico border, the Dakotas, Western Minnesota, Western Kansas, Nebraska are still hosting hotspots. Iowa remains a suspect donut hole of data, long reporting in lesser counts than uh, its Midwest neighbors. We're going down, uh, we're down here to 43% of the American people in communities subjected to high to extremely high COVID exposure, and, and that's terrific news, although that may be in part dependent on the reductions in testing. At the same time, we still have another 43% subjected to substantial exposure. The outbreak stateside continues to evolve, with here the continued explosive emergence of XBB 1.5, with BQ 1.1 still holding on, and BQ1 on its way out, although this is entirely dependent on place. Here's the 15-day trend of all the genetic sequences of detected sublineages in the US as of March 5th, including their geographic origins. So XBB 1.5 in blue is surging ahead in states across the country, with BQ1.1 in red and much lesser frequencies, although still widespread, alongside uh, other XBB sublineages. There are all sorts of other subvariants of sublineages circulating in such a way as to offer possible candidates for the next dominant variant or to contribute to the next recombinant that accelerates beyond both vaccine and population immunity. Multiply that diversity by the world, and we have a pandemic still very much in play. And that's part one of our COVID this week from the People CDC. We'll post a part two on the origins of COVID-19 on our YouTube channel. You can learn more about the People CDC and read this week's COVID weather report at our website, peoplecdc.org.